Go ahead and turn you loose. It's 10 o'clock. It's 10 o'clock. Uh, if y'all don't know who I am, you're going to get to know me in probably another six months. I'll be all over the world telling jokes. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Donald. Uh, I go by Donald Martin. is my mother. That's what my mother named me. But my stage name is Michelle. F-O-S-H-O. And I'm your host today for the second, second annual. Last year, was so, so this is mm -hmm. uh, So, first of all, I want to give a shout out to James Montgomery uh, for putting this together. Let's show him some love. Uh, one thing about everything, like sometimes I'm more, um, I'll be one of the presenters, I'm going to host, but also be a presenter at 1 o'clock. Uh, just kind of give you an idea of who I am. I'm an entrepreneur, because um, you, you may not be here at 1 o'clock. But just real quick before I bring up Mr. Middleton, uh, uh, I started uh, January 23rd. We opened up our own uh, convenience store. It's called Sweet Treats on Martin Street. It's in the, the, the worst part of town on 38th and Big Office when we talk about money for the community. We opened up in a, a food desert area. And so what we did is we decided to open it up because we wanted to make sure that uh, our community have options. And so I, I have some flyers and we'll talk about that later, but make sure that they have options. Instead of going to the gas stations, instead of going to the places where they're charging two or three times as much for the same product, we charge less than they do, but also we give them a safe place so they can come in as well and be able to get the same. We're going to get to know your name. We got uniforms. We go in the plaza. So, because we believe even on the far east side, you must still show what that's what it's looking like. You should not have to go to Fishers, Avon, Brownsburg, guys. We can bring it right to where the crime is at the most than ever, but we are in the pillar in the community showing what we do. So, saying all that to say this, make sure it's a very important energy is very important. The more energy you have, the more the presenter can be like uh, just flowing. I'm telling you, you can look at somebody like, I don't know you, who are you, who are you, I need to know. But then, you know, I, I want Mr. Wilson, when he comes up here, I just want him to be able to just knock it out the ball, uh -huh. or throw him an alley you know, <laughs> I used to play basketball. I haven't used to work. But, so we're going to get, and so I'm just, we're so glad that you took time out your day uh -huh. to be here, because you can be anywhere else watching Price is Right or uh, watching the Judge show, but you're here today. And so we're glad that you're here today. So without further ado, welcome to the second annual uh, business. I'm to my words a little bit. <laughs> it's all right. So I'm, I'm from Flint, Michigan, so I'll be making sure I get everything right. So without further ado, so I want to kind of give you information about this first gentleman. Just met him. I've been knowing him for like two minutes. And uh, <laughs> so it's great to have him. He's originally from Fort Wayne, but he's been in the city of Indianapolis for a while. So without further ado, I want to introduce to you the CEO of George Middleton Consulting LLC. Let's give a hand for George Middleton. Dream of a land which is better, 
richer and fuller for every man with opportunity for each according to his ability or achievements. This quote is philosophically in alignment with one of the primary tenets of our Constitution. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. How authentically are we living up to that tenet <coughs> of the American dream today? Annual statistics on the quantitative outcomes in this area tell us that we are not doing a very good job. These statistics represent just one area of systemic inequality, race. Now there are many other types of disparities, but for the purposes of this presentation, we will use race as the example. You know, I'm, I wonder what good it does to have uh, a remote control that I got to <laughs> <laughs> particularly as it pertains to the black and white households. It's projected that by the year 2053, the average level of wealth per black family will be zero dollars. <coughs> African American families have just a fraction of the wealth of white families. Even in the case of positive factors, such as increased educational levels, African Americans still have less wealth than whites. Notice the three racially non-white categories, the levels of wealth noted in the light blue columns representing bachelor's degree or higher, as compared to the racially white column, that at their national uh, average level of wealth. Less wealth translates into fewer opportunities for upward mobility. It's compounded by less income levels and fewer chances to build wealth or accumulate wealth and pass it down generations. How many of you here are business owners? Awesome, because that's what this is all about, right? Yes, sir. Business ownership, a prime component of the American dream, <coughs> a building block in building wealth and accumulating wealth and transferring wealth generation. The summer of 2020 brought us mass protests calling for structural reform to fight institutionalized racism and police brutality. In addition, it was compounded by COVID-19, which ripped off the cover of systemic racial disparities. Since then, there's been a continued call for the support for black-owned businesses. However, an April 2020 report from the Center for Responsible Lending found that 95% of black-owned businesses stood close to no chance of receiving a PPP loan from a major 
banking or credit union institution. The reason being to research is because it was found that black owned businesses are less likely to have the necessary relationships required with their lending institution. In addition to that, lending institutions were allowed to create their own requirements for lending. <coughs> and because of that, they were incentivized to lend to larger companies, which the stimulus loan was not designed to do. It was for the smaller companies. So think about that. So there are some key words that I want you to consider when we open this up for a general discussion in the, the reasoning as to why this behavior occurs, or occurs, it still occurs. Relationships, question to consider and talk about in a few. Why do, don't black business ownership owners have the necessary relationships with their lending institutions? Why? The next key word I want you to consider is this phrase, black owned businesses. Black owned businesses in America. Black owned American businesses. There's a lot going on with that phrase. Mm -hmm. There's a lot going on in that phrase, and I want to be able to discuss it. And this leads me to a question that we will also discuss. Does identity by skin color determine who gets how much of the American dream? And this is what inspired me to develop my latest work. It's a workbook titled with the question I asked you to keep in mind at the beginning, can you be American and a color too? It's not a read, it's not a book for reading, it's a book for working. Mm -hmm. okay. Because we do a lot of talking about race, but nothing changes that. <clears throat> so I hope to be able to provide you with the process to be able to start tangibly counteracting the statistics that we're talking about. My, my workbook is based on eight principles. I'm just going to discuss with you two of those eight. One, being human beings, us, are a genetic species. Secondly, Race ideology is a social construct, meaning race is not genetic. Now, some of you may already know this. It might be new information to many, many others of you. It's no criticism either way. It doesn't matter whether you know it or don't. We're still having these systemic racial inequalities. So we, whether you can describe the problem or not, it's irrelevant. What's the solution? How do we, you know, how do we overcome or counteract this systemic behavior? And it's important for you as business owners. I'm, I'm a therapist. Your business, your business is a reflection of you. Your business is a reflection of your mental state. And if you create your own business, there's nothing more close to your quality of life your mental state of mind as the health of your business and the process of creating your business. So, dealing with the principle, the, the principle number two, race as a social construct. Most of us don't realize that when we're talking race, this is what we're talking about. <coughs> Many of us are totally oblivious and unconscious and unintentional when we speak. Now, we do have a small population in our country that are very intentional. They understand this, and they are intentional in how they're using race. But most of us just want to live, get a 
along, love each other, treat each other like Christians. If you aspire to that, that faith, uh, or whatever your uh, religious or spiritual process is. This ideology gets in the way of that. And it happens on a very subconscious basis. The labels black and white are racial classification systems from that social construct. And that's a really challenging fact for many people to accept. Uh, in my work, Here's the resistance that I often find when I'm doing this work. For those who identify as black, it makes them want to cling to the label of black because black is all they know. Don't take my blackness away. Don't take it away. For those who identify as white, it awakens up something that they don't want to be awake. Because for fear of being called a racist or imply that there's something that they did, so now, you know, it's my responsibility, it wasn't my people. And so those are the type of reactions because they've taken these social construct identities on a personal basis. Mm -hmm. So that's the initial resistance that I see. This happens with everybody, but I see that behavior more often than not. But the basic idea about race is that it is a social construct created by the European, not by white people. White people did not create race. The European created the ideology and called one group white, the other group black. Now let me ask you guys this question. In race ideology, which group is on top and which group is on bottom? White group is on top and black group is on bottom. You all seem to be know. Mm -hmm. A three-year-old knows that. And this is uh, by, research, by statistic research. Three of y'all know that answer to the question. <clears throat> in, 18, in the 1850s, slavery was abolished. But America still practiced identifying by skin color. The identity of skin color came in for the justification of slavery so that it could be uh, sold to the community for the type of treatment and behavior that they were doling out to the African. So even though slavery was abolished, the mindset of race ideology was still in place. And this is important because this is something that all of us participate in. Oftentimes, when you get in these discussions on race, uh, it's, it's like, well, if they would stop doing this, then we would be okay. It's not true. Because we all internalize the ideology. So, question. What would life look like if we took the color out of that label? Life without color is void. Life without color is what? It's void. Life without color, yeah. Life without color. I didn't say take the color out of life. Take the color out of the word. Out of the label. It's void. Void of what? Existence. Okay, we're we'll, we'll going to talk about that. The one identity which points to the first principle is human being. Who in here is a human being? So here's something that many of us, some of you may know, but many of us don't, don't consciously recognize. Human beings, us in this room, we are 99.9% .9 genetically identical. No matter how we look, no matter how we look, we're genetically identical. So what is the difference between a black American and a white American? Something to talk about. And question for you to consider uh, that I want you to walk away with, for you, 
this your identity? Are you your culture or are you your color? Because the two are not the same. There's racial identity and then there's cultural identity. And both of those identities are very powerful and they serve two different purposes. <coughs> they are not in alignment with each other. And what I, what I find in my work is that many of us are experiencing cultural dissonance, the cognitive dissonance in trying to live between culture and color. Mm -hmm. So what I've just handed to you is one of my work activities. It comes out of this book, Beliefs, Limiting Authentic Cultural Knowledge. And what you have there is called the Cultural Trust Survey. And it's designed for whatever you, any identity that you see yourself as. There's no right or wrong answers. There's no good or bad. It's just how you honestly think. So I would like you to consider those uh, as we continue this, this, the discussion. And just be honest with yourself. The worst lies we can tell are the ones we tell ourselves. And with that, I'd like to open up the floor for discussion. And please, this is a safe zone. Mm -hmm. You know, we're talking about race. There's no fear. There's no judgment. As a therapist, I need to hear the real stuff, not the you know nice veneer that we want to do. <laughs> you know, we're all good people here. Mm -hmm. But you know, sometimes you got to say it the way you can. You got to say it. You, you know, we we have had different experiences based on skin color. Mm -hmm. Both are true. Both are true. Mm -hmm. So let's honor each other's experience. So, the floor is open. Awesome. <laughs> Here you go. Uh -huh. Are you coming or are you your own culture? This is a subject very interesting to me considering the fact my, I'm just going to walk into my own life. When we were raised, my brother and I, we did we were raised in a place where we didn't know <coughs> we didn't know the barriers of color. Because our parents just didn't raise us like that. So I didn't get uh, introduced to it. Well, I got introduced to it uh, maybe in the late nineties. And that was because I married out of my race. Didn't think that I would be affected by it because I was never raised that way. Until me and my husband, we were out and uh, <clears throat> we were getting ready to sit down and eat and I walked in the restaurant and we were tired and, and the woman walked up to me and my husband and she placed the place set in front of him. And me and the children were sat there and uh, she turned and talked to him. Uh, what can I get you today? And he said, well, first you can start by getting my wife and my children. <laughs> 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 They're settings. And, and then he looked at me and he says, let's leave. And this was like 1 o'clock in the morning and I was tired. And I was like, no, well, let's not leave. No, I'm going to here. We're going to eat. But uh, I'm going to be watching over there in the kitchen. Make sure you're <laughs> <laughs> right? I'm going to be watching the man I'm a little alert, right? Mm -hmm. But that was the first time I had ever been addressed with any type of racial discomfort. And I'm in my late, oh, you know, 20s. 20s, yeah. <laughs> 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 you know, and that was the first time I had ever witnessed anything like that because my parents never raised us <coughs> out of anything but we were humans. And so I didn't know that color was a thing in our life. Then, my daughter, I learned once we moved to a different state, which was the state from where I had known any color barriers at all. We were raised in Colorado. So we didn't know different color barriers until I went and raised my children back there in that state. And I realized that because my children were of different shades, then that they would be faced with 
different things in their upbringing. And uh, my daughter, <laughs> she had, because she's very light complexion, she had uh, uh, little friends of all different uh, nationalities and everything. And it never dawned on me that one little girl come to our house and all she seen was my husband and my daughter. She wasn't worried about me. She, I was just, I was the Angela's mom, and she was comfortable with that. I was the Angela's mom, and I was friendly and I was nice, and so she was fine with that. And so when she came to our house, and little cousins start coming, and they were all of different colors and everything. This little girl, she was seven years old. She looked and she started crying, and she said, "I have to leave. I can't be here." And my husband come running upstairs and he said, we have an emergency. And I said, what do you mean? I said, well, what happened? He said, the little girl's down here crying. She has to leave. She has to follow her around. And I said, well, what's the problem? And she said, it's too many black people. I'm waiting for Angela's white cousins to come. And they're, they're, not, they're not coming. And, and I said, huh? Because <laughs> I hadn't had a child ever address me like that. I was confused. And I said, baby, I said, what are you saying? She said, my grandmother says, I, I can't be around black people and I have to go home and I have to go home right now. And I said, well, can we call her? And she says, I, 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 I can't call her because I can't be here, so you know. And I said, well, let's call your family. And I said, before your family comes, can you stay long enough to do a project? And the little girl said yes. Her sister came and her boyfriend came and uh, her sister was very apologetic and, and she said yes, that's my grandmother's wishes that uh, she said, but we don't raise her like that and so if she wants to stay, she can stay. Well, the project that I did with Rachel was all the girls had to come to the table with their grandma and they had to draw me a picture. And the picture they had to draw was a rainbow. Because I wanted them to see how we were raised through the lens of God. And God had a variety of color. And he blended us all together. And, and with that assignment, this little child, she, she asked, she, she was at my house almost every day after that. But with that assignment, it did something for me being an adult. And it did something for her that I hope changes the rest of her life. Um, so that's a very interesting uh, question. And how would you answer for yourself? How do you, how do you, do you identify racially or do you identify culture? I identify with culture. And what's the name of the culture? What's the name of the culture? What's the name of the culture? Yeah. So when I'm talking about culture, culture, I'm referring to ethnicity, you know, uh, which is the over umbrella. A lot of people, times people say, well, my culture is my education or my religion, or, I'm not talking about like that because culture encompasses all that. What is with culture is usually associated with a geography, a location. So, what is your ethnic culture? Mine's personally mm -hmm. are just mm, that's interesting. <laughs> and that's okay this, this is, I, 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 so mine. Huh? Yeah, that's something you brought because mine personally, <coughs> it still would be I, I am I am still a a, a blank slate okay. because I still don't see color. That's mine okay. personally, but but I've learned. This is what I've learned. Mm -hmm. I've learned because my husband had a different uh, way of living, and 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 I had a different way of living. Then we had a different way of living to raise our children. And so I learned throughout the years <coughs> how to become one. Right. But you just don't have a, a name, right? I, I don't have a one. <laughs> one would be my name. One. One would be my name because I've learned to become that one. Uh, so. Okay, understood. The, the event that you share with us, and thank you for sharing that because that, that is just an amazingly personal and powerful story. Amazingly, amazingly powerful. 
that event that you shared with us is an, an experience that many of us have gone through in different, in different ways. And it's called negresis. And negresis is a theory formed by a psychologist, James Cross, and it's a five-stage model. And it's used to describe the experiences associated with becoming a psychologically healthy black man or woman in the United States. The event that you just described is called the encounter stage. The encounter stage is when an individual is faced with a experience or set of experiences directly related to race that cause him or her to re-examine their own identity. Because as you said, I, I had no color mindset until I was faced with it, right? Now, in, in this regressive theory, there's another stage called the pre-encounter stage. In the pre-encounter stage, really listen carefully to this. In the pre-encounter stage, individuals do not believe that race is an important aspect of identity. In the pre-encounter stage, individuals do not believe that race is an important aspect of identity. Which causes me to question the use of race in the first place. You said there's only one race. And, and what you what you hear people who who are well intended well intentioned they'll say there's only one race the human race not mean well it's, it's, it's not accurate yeah. it's not accurate because human beings are genetic race is a social ideology okay. so you can't you know it's like being a, if you're not <coughs> if you're not alcoholic you can't be a little bit of an alcoholic you can all the way up. So, so race is, we're race of all this. And even if you try to well intentioned dumb it down to one race, you're still addicted. You have to leave, you have to leave, you know, racial thinking gets racial outcomes. The ideology is about division. So when people say racial unity, racial equality, those are oxymorons. You don't take a butter knife to, to hammer a nail. And you don't take race to be inclusive and non-discriminatory. Race is to discriminate and to divide mm -hmm. and to put on hierarchies. So you, you can't have racial equality. You're going to have one or the other. You're going to be racial or you're going to be cultural. But you can't be both. I, I think go. Uh, Culture spills over into the culture. Tell me. So, like, let's just give you an example. Uh, uh, me and my management, we was on our way to the Apollo, um, and we it was traffic. We was in the fourth row, because I'm six three, six four. <laughs> my, but you know, gas. I'm we drove to New York, so we was and I was working at a dealership at the time, so I was. Uh, we was trying to find something with gas to come. That's what we were looking at. And so we had plates on it or whatever like that. And my, my management, he's six four, six five. Wow. Uh, with a what a show. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm gonna have a bodyguard slash manager just just in case you might want to Will Smith me, but that's a case. <laughs> 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 in case you might want to Will Smith me. But that being said. He has, so he has gold in his mouth and everything like that. We have a Ford Focus. We got Indiana Place. We in Pennsylvania. Uh, traffic is backed up. And so culturally, we, the culture as well, it looks like it, we transport it. Uh, we transport it. So when I say culture and color, like the culture of what we look like, the culture of what we was driving and everything, but also our color matched the culture as far as the thinking of the offer of the state trooper. I hope I'm making sense. So it, it matched the state trooper. So when he pulled us over, his reason for pulling us <coughs> over, we was too close to another vehicle. But it was construction. So he comes out, he, he spits his uh he spits his uh, uh 
uh, chew or whatever they had in, and you know, where are you going? I'm showing. And now, at this point, we, we, we go, and I believe I want to live to see another day, so I respect, I, I respect authority. So my culture, the, the culture that I'm talking about, I'm not looking at the man as a white man, I'm looking at his authority as an officer. So I'm going to respect his, his title, not, because at this point, even if he racial profiling, I'm not thinking about him being racist. because he has authority, he has a gun, he has everything that can take my life. And so he comes over to the passenger side, and I, my manager's driving, and he asks, uh, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to the Apollo. He said, what are you doing? I said, I'm a comedian. He said, tell me a joke. I'm about to tell him a joke. He didn't want, he didn't want to tell him. Whatever it takes. <laughs> Whatever it takes to get to the Apollo. Get their breathing. Yeah, right, right, right. I mean, I'm not worried about, you know what I'm saying? You doing this because I'm black? No. Because somewhat the culture fit the color as well. And because of the, the, the way my, the culture of hip hop and all that kind of thing. So anyway, after that, uh, you asked for my idea as well. Now, technically, I'm going to try this with you, whatever, but just to confuse, because his cultural ways and my cultural ways are two different things, I gave my idea. So we was able to move on from that. And so what I mean is sometimes, uh, as people, we get caught up, because it's, it's some black people have not, like you said, your situation, have not experienced racism. They have experienced that type of racism, because a lot of times culture has a lot to do, and we can talk about economics another day, but culture and economics has a lot to do with how you look at it. So if you add the, the color out, sometimes it's just, to me, icing on the cake. Because if you if you look a certain way, you can get you can get roughed up, but once you find out my color of my skin, or you see the color of my skin, then it becomes. So I think culture and, and color kind of goes together. Because you have, I have, I have black friends that have never experienced the black racism. Or I mean, never. So when you see something like some television say, I never experienced racism, because that in their cultural system is because they may be in another status, just like the way we grew up. We grew up with discipline that we pulled out children. We got whooped all the time. And so the, the culture thing is you think whites don't did whoop their children and blacks only do. But then when you find out that that's a misconception of it. It just depends on the culture you're in, but you're thinking that, you know, I have black friends and say, I know I got a woman. I got a punishment. I got to put the time out. And you're like, what? <laughs> like, but, but that's the culture, not necessarily the culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's what I, that's all that makes sense. No, Chris, let me ask you a question. Are you talking, is it possible that when you're talking about this culture, is really stereotypes. That's that's a good point. Stereotypes, because stereotypes that that's that's a great point. Because stereotypes is a stereotypes is I, I believe stereotypes is based on your experience with another race. I think it's based on skill. I think it's based on your experience. That's what I'm saying. But or just even dealing with because you know um, there's a culture that are black people always like that. That's a you know, like I said, I'm a comedian, so I hear a lot of things, and I, you know, that's one of the jokes for you. Black people are always like, <laughs> now that's a stereotype, because that's based on if you work with some black people, you know, you know, if you work with some white people, that's your experience. And so what we use is we take them stereotypes, and then we mask it upon every side of the race. You know, I have a <clears> point. <throat> so I just told you. So, <laughs> and we were a blended family. We were a very diverse family uh, from a child up. So we, we didn't know any different. Until we crossed the state line and <laughs> <You> found <out. laughs> we found out gradually in transition. Uh, I would say maybe he was starting from, I mean, we caught the bus, so I remember this as a child. My mother and James and I, we caught the bus here. Our father was already here, uh, which is, this is my father's a native of Indiana. So 
So this is how we came back to Indiana, because our father was a native of Indiana. And he's 85 years old now. So he knows everything there is to know about the state. He purposely kept James and I in certain areas of the state because he knew that we had never seen this way of living when we came here. Interesting. He wanted yeah, you can't go past the basic place of life of the park. He, <laughs> he wanted your vision. He, he, brought wanted, he brought our vision to reality quickly. And so what he did was he kept us in all black neighborhoods. <laughs> oh, they said me. Mm -hmm. He kept us. <laughs> At that time that we came here, the avenue from where it was up and coming, mm -hmm. Adam, CJ Walker, and everything back in his day was up and moving. Yeah, that was up and moving. But when we came, yeah. <laughs> it was not happening right there. So we came in the 80s. <laughs> so it was tore up. <laughs> Homeless people out on the street. Uh, people loitering, people dreaming, um, our eyes. True story. We would ride in the car and we would put covers over our head because we were so scared. We were terrified. True story. And we did that for months. Uh, my father would take us on the south side. He would take us maybe a little on the north side. At the beginning of maybe north side, maybe 38th Street and Capitol or something. <laughs> he would take us past Brown Hill. <laughs> he had a border, he kept us in. Because we had never seen that type of, that style of living. And so, what we learned was we had never seen so many professional black people. Mm. It's what I start learning. Because there was so many in our own culture that we would see people, bus drivers, restaurant people, workers, we had never seen that. So I mean, of our own culture, <coughs> working, people out here working, making a living, families, mothers, fathers, children playing. Um, there were so many different things that I was able to recognize coming up that I had never seen before in my own culture. Where you keep talking, more you just jog my memory. But, but this is crazy. But this is that a very true story. story that we had never seen. I had never, I had never thought about it. You know, my mother was a stay-at-home mom. My father was a professional man. My our father was a, our father was a professor. So you have those stories, though. Right. And right. Then you're like your parents right. older than starting out. Yeah, and like kind of exposed you to different things and kind of made your perception of you know how you thought about the things and different things. And you just jog on the ground and say something. Right. <laughs> well, you want to say something? No, I, was, I, was, I was born in 68, which means I was a child in the 80s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Going to elementary school in the late 70s, the late 70s, and going to high school in the middle of the, the early uh, 80s. Like, so I was born in 68. Mm -hmm. So you were born in 1968. Forced if you went to some schools, you were forced to deal with the culture of the community, and there was there was some serious issues where people didn't know how to get each other. You know, they see differences and they <clears throat> instead of trying to see differences and celebrate that, then find what makes you similar. Right? Because I think if, if you take that time, I mean, James knows this a lot. Of you can you know this. I'm very much the person who I want to work with people that looks like the world. I don't want a bunch of six foot four white guys to work with. <laughs> <laughs> I know I know what that is. Yeah, right. 
So I'm very, I try to be very inclusive. I try not to lead by race. I like to have a culture. Because culture can be, you can have the same culture with anyone. It doesn't have to be. George and I look different, but you know, see I have a lot of stuff. Right? And that's culture. So in Indianapolis, the suburbs are going through this because the wealth is moving was in Zion School when I was a little kid, now it's moving all the way to Pendleton. And you've seen the culture changing in all those places. And they're going through all those growing pains at the same time. The thing that I saw in the early 80s, I'm seeing out in Pendleton. When I was doing my student teaching on Mount Vernon, and it was just starting, that culture was starting to blend. And I just saw so many of these farm kids, those people, like, what do you mean by those people? Well, they don't look like me, but they're the same. And it was a very uncomfortable conversation I had with students with my teacher, who was doing my master teacher, who I was teaching for. He's like, don't do it. The guy was a hippie from the 60s. I mean, he did those beatnik, you know, uh, slams, right? So, I mean, he wasn't racist, but I mean, oh, no, you don't talk about it. I'm like, dude, you got to talk about it. So, so they are kind of lazy. I want to try to jump in on this tantrum. I always tell you real quick if I can. I just wanted to show you kind of how I see the color um, versus culture. I believe solely that this is a topic about the black uh, disparities amongst races. And I completely see that there is no culture and there is no color. And that is because it has been stolen. You know, we are we are a lost people, the people of color. So how could you have either of the two when they have been taken from us? Okay, this is a very deep, passionate subject for a lot of people because we are seeking so many information. Yes. The age of information is now. So I wrote down a couple of key things I wanted to talk about. One being, I cannot label, although the only thing to label myself as is a black African American that will even come close to how I identify myself, my color, or my culture. I am an indigenous Aboriginal, okay? And that's one of the things that most people of color do not understand. Those people who lost so much, we are the people who were taken from. We come from the Niji or Cherokee and Blackfoot people. Those are our tribes. That is our culture. But how can I exercise our culture when it has been taken? I don't know our language. I don't know our heritages. I don't know anything. I just know from my ancestors, our pictures, our, you know, stuff like that. Doing that research with actual recorded documents, not Ancestry.com, not anybody trying to check us from, you know, different cultures and islands. That's not how you're going to obtain who we are. How can we stand up and place where we are if we don't even know who we are? How can we ask for retributions or anything if we don't even know how to correctly ask or to show who we are or what we need this for? Okay. So color is shown through anger, and I want to I want to just put that out there. Color is shown through anger, and then color is then black. I'm going to say it again. Color is shown through anger, therefore color becomes black. Does that make sense? Yes. So, life without color is void. There has to be a contribution amongst people, black people and white people, people of all colors. There has to be a contribution from each one of us in order for us to kind of understand each other as a human, a human, <laughs> because the understanding of genetics is why we don't have color, because we don't understand our genetics as a human. We don't, how can we understand something that we, we don't know? We, there's not enough information, enough anything. And the, no culture, because the history was told, once again. And this comes from a lack of each one of us teaching each other. Within those contributions, that's how we teach each other. We all have something to give to each other, no matter what color you are. And that's where it becomes each one, reach one, teach one. Because if we do that, we, we, we take away that void, and then we add color from each one of us, which brings about life. When you have enough color, therefore life happens. The genetic makeup happens. And I think a lot of people don't really understand that we come from those plants. We come from, you know, those seedlings sprouting and fertilizing. That's how our genetics came about, you know? And it's, those are things that have been taken from us. So ignorance, ignorance is a lack of knowledge. So in, therefore, if you say in law that the lack of knowledge is no exception to the rule. Mm -hmm. The lack of knowledge is no exception to the rule. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we 
A once prominent, I would say, historian said something that was very important that I take me today, and I'm going to just leave the information alone that I just shared because it's way deeper than that. It takes hours and hours to actually go through this. But he once said that lack of knowledge is very, uh, knowledge is very important, but the way that any persons can actually become void is that if you don't read, because you can put anything in a book, and people choose primarily because we you see the, the data that you just pulled up, who's at the lowest of the spectrum or the people of color. Because if you put something in a book, then therefore it becomes history because we will not read it for numerous reasons why we won't read history or his story instead of bringing about our own story, our story, because we have that. So, but those are not things that are being shared. A lot of these different topics of conversations will bring about more information for our people, but we have to start somewhere, and that's where primarily my company, we definitely start the root issues of everything, so. Now, if you haven't written everything you just said down, mm -hmm. make sure she gets a copy of this, because mm -hmm. that needs to go in your book. Oh, yeah. 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 Just to come back to uh, the stereotype versus culture scenario, uh, that's important because I think what happens is we conflate color with culture. And one of your most salient points is that the unique aspect about being a black American is that we're the only population whose culture was literally taken away, literally stripped. And we, because we don't know what our tribal affiliation is, what our geographic location is, all we know is slavery. Our history starts from slavery, right? However, just because you don't know your culture doesn't mean your culture has left you. We find ourselves, regardless of what, what, you, what you consciously know, culture is cellular. Knowledge is cellular. Okay? So you find yourselves, and this applies to anybody, not just quote unquote black people. You find yourself doing things and you're like, why do I always do it this way? You know why? Because it was some history before you that led you that way. You can take uh, an example. This a stereotype, which is dance. Black people can dance. <laughs> That's a stereotype. Okay. Free labor 
of, in, of uh, correction centers across the country. It's, they're not called private prison industry. And here's the thing. Each state is required to keep a quota of beds filled in each prison. And if they don't, the uh, corrections industry can sue the state to recoup their losses. So if you have a prison for private, who are the customers that they need? Okay? So here's the thing, and this started back in the 1800s because the next day after slavery was abolished, they created what was called the Black Codes. And the Black Code says that if you're not legally employed, you, you are to be arrested and detained. Mm -hmm. that, that still exists. So it's, you, you have to, you know, it's, it becomes a game of semantics. Well, slavery's over, so get over it. But you still got the same dynamics, you still got the same racially based outcomes. <clears throat> so moving from uh, stereotypes to culture, let me, let me read you the definition of culture so that it sets the template. Culture serves to distinguish a people from others. It refers to the totality of the pattern of behavior of a particular group of people. And in that totality of patterns of behavior it includes your religious practices, your dress, your dance, your rituals, your your uh, traditions, ceremonies. So when you refer to the Hispanic culture, you can automatically think about the rituals you need to do, the music you need to do, the foods you need to do. When you think about the African culture, automatically you're thinking differently in terms of the dress, the, the languages, the belief systems, right? Uh, uh, German culture, and, and here's the other thing, with each of these cultural names that I just uh, gave you, you can also associate the geography with that culture, right? If you're of German culture, what's your geography? Germany. If you're of Mexican culture, what's your geography? If you're of white culture, what's your geography? Korean. No. If you're, if you're of white culture, what's your geography? America. If you're of white culture, what, what land, what? Mass land body is associated with white. Canada. No. <laughs> 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 oh, it's called European. European. No, no, no. What is it? I said if you're white, if you're white, what land, what land mass is automatically? The whole world. Oh, just like United States of America. Just America. America? Let's say European. So, what, so whites are, are American? That's interesting. Next so year. whites are, okay, so if you're black, what land mass is associated with that? America. Why? Because they say they hang on the bones and we curse. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you say African. Well, we don't have one. Well, Key we word, right. it was said. <laughs> we don't have one. You guys are confusing me. Uh, <laughs> right, so, right, so, right, so, right, so, right, so, it's not making me think. I'm wondering if you see in the pattern. Does anybody see what I'm saying? Uh -huh. That people of color do not have one. We that there is no land mass associated with color. You know, here in America, they use the word Caucasian to refer to who? White. White. You don't mean color. It's incorrect. What is it? Caucasians refer to a particular region. Caucasus Mountains. And within that region, everybody in here has a complexion of Caucasian. Only in America do you use Caucasian to associate with the color white. And it's incorrect. I did not know that. I just learned something new today. Color does not have a land mass. You have people with light skin that live in Africa and people with dark skin that live in Africa. Absolutely. You have people with light skin in Mexico and people with dark skin in Mexico. Right. Same way in Germany. You go to any land mass, you're going to see a variety of skin color. What unites them is culture. So I can be French if I was born in France or I've lived a long time in France, have adopted the languages, the belief systems, the food, the dress. 
they can look at me and see I think I'm something else. That's what I'm thinking about France, George, and I, I, I got to go here in a couple notes. Yes. The thing about France is they don't call each other African French. They don't They're do French. You're French. You're French. Right? Yep. And, and to take that a step further, I've got a friend who was born in Africa. Mm -hmm. He lives in America. He's a citizen. He's white. So technically, he's African American. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I've had, I've had, I've had many. I do this work a lot. I've had many a, a time where somebody with light skin and says, "Hey, you know, I'm African." And like it was supposed to shock me, <laughs> right? Like I was like, well, "You can't be African, man." You now, before I started doing this work, I might have fought for it. Right? I might have fallen for it because I would have been under the stereotype. That only black people are from Africa, <laughs> which is not true. All right? Color and culture are not the same. So now I know I, I'm getting close to the end here. I probably, it's time to wrap up. Mm -hmm. the, the, these are cultural trust surveys I gave you. Uh, they're for your self reflection to see how you have internalized race. What is your participation with this race ideology? So the question, are you your color, are you your culture? I want you to really think about that. Because the more specific you can know, there are people that we're competing with economically that can answer that question right now. So if, what's the advantage of competing with somebody who knows who they are and you don't? Mm -hmm. Right? Because if you know who you are and you're in league with others who are the same way, then they don't even have to communicate. It's like, we know what our standards are. We know what to do is automatic. Versus, which we see in the black racial demographic, we are the least collective, we are the least standardized, we don't spend our money in our institutions, we have adopted and internalized all the negative stereotypes of each other that we accuse people who are white of doing. We do the job on ourselves better than anybody else because we have internalized the ideology. So if you're a business owner, your, your attitude about race is going to affect the way you do your business. Your attitude about race is going to determine the customers that you are serving. Your attitude about race is going to affect your mental health. It's called mental side. When you don't know who you are, that's a tack of the mind. And you can be easy manipulated because you don't even know who you are. So you want to really answer those questions. Thank you, everybody.